All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can hear me quite well up the back? Okay, I won't move around, so I'll stay at the same speed. All righty. So what I'm here today for is to give you an insight of following on from what Jeffrey's saying. We've got global problems. We got problems here in Australia with banking. It's just about three stories a day on banks now, isn't it? It's all negative, isn't it? Well, the worst hasn't come out yet. You don't know what they've been doing to get their grubby little hands on other people's assets across Australia and you could be next or one of your family could be next and you don't know it. If someone stole your house, would you tell all the family? Would you? Some of you would. But if you, if you were angry enough and you started to figure it out, you would, and, and that spreads the word. But for years, people don't like talking about finance, do they? We are very cautious about that. And we keep it to ourselves and suffer in silence. And that's where I come in. 18 years ago, I had already, for the previous 20, or 10, 15 years, looked after people who had been um, tricked into losing their life savings, mainly retirees, and that was mainly in the area of uh, solicitor mortgage scandals, finance broker scandals, let me lend you your money, and then the money disappears. During that time, I started to get the media sending me a lot of little bunnies with one ear to look after, and I'm hopeless at doing that. I just say yes every time. So it snowballed, and I had suddenly another group of people who were pensioners that owned their own home, that retired with very little super, but worked hard all their lives like everybody else, and were entitled to an Australian retirement, it's not about whether somebody retired with a large pot of super and others didn't. We're all in the same boat. I certainly didn't. My super was 16 grand. Okay, so the point is that we have the ability to expose what is going wrong in our country on our own bat. And we can just get together and put our heads together and work out how we fix this. All right? So that's where we're going with this at the moment. The point is we want to expose the bank control fraud. So I'm going to let you in on the secrets of the banking scandal that you're starting to get a sense that something is not going quite right. The bank CEOs, the bank staff, the bank brokers, or the bank borrowers that borrowed the money, or the regulators. Who is to blame? And that's what we're going to explore today. Who controlled this fraud? It just doesn't happen because a few blokes were out there or girls and they're ripping off the little old lady down the street. This is organised crime on a massive level that America experienced to bring on the GFC. Again, lazy, good-for-nothing regulators. You won't hear anything in this room about me praising them for one second. Not one. The fraud is the crime, and it's actually a criminal act. Do we put these people in jail? No. Which country put people in jail in the world at the moment? One country, one tiny little country? Iceland. Somebody's got the real fortitude to go after these blokes. The key element that shocked me the most, that got me going... 18 years ago, to really start digging deep, as ASIC call it, a deep dive. Don't you just love that word, a deep dive? They wouldn't even know what the word was. Right, so the, the point was the intention to deceive. Doesn't that attack all our senses of decency? When somebody intends to do something, and it's so horrendous, it's going to steal that lady's house or that gentleman's house down the road that they worked for all those years. Went without, didn't often have a holiday, but they own their own little castle. Now, I love that movie, The Castle. <laughs> I've watched it so many times. 
So the fraudulent misrepresentations that we're going to show you now is quite horrific. And the bankers engineered these products. They actually, 16 blokes, and there was one lady later on, sat round a table and intended to steal as many homes, rip off as many elderly Australians as they could get their grubby little hands on. Is that okay with you? No. Yeah, it's not okay with me. And they created force and reckless signatures on documents and force and reckless statements to suggest to these people, we are the major banks, you can trust us. We've been here for a hundred odd years, we will not let you down. No one thought they were talking to Al Capone. Nobody had an idea, but that's where it was coming from. So we've been talking for a long time about the black box. How many here have already seen YouTube number one, the bombshell? Yeah. All right, well, there's a few of you out there, so I suggest that you also watch. This is part two. So go and watch part one. It's on there. Just put in bombshell Denise Braley. Google has a funny sense of humor, <laughs> but it's out there. So the mechanics of the fraud are this. It's like a, the black box is like the data flight recorder in an airline jet. You've got to open it up and see what they were chatting about in the cockpit, do we not? Very simple to me. I might be a criminologist and I might be a real oddball, but I know that that's where you start. I want to listen to those early conversations around the boardroom table. I then want to know what tools they used what engines they created to get this into such a big level of theft. Out of $1.2 trillion, sorry, $1.8 trillion worth of mortgage loans at the moment in Australia, it's my belief based on the evidence, 1.2, and I might be wrong, it might be a lousy 900 uh, billion, but it's an awful lot of money, are IO loans. Anyone here know what an IO loan is? Yes, that's the whole point. No one knows what an I.O. is. They sold it, they bought it, they married it, but it's interest only. Hands up all those who knew what a bridging loan was. Yeah, there's a few of you. No, the old bridging loan. The worst, most expensive loan in the world and you didn't want it for more than a year, did you? Yeah, well, the banks were very clever. They didn't mention the I.O. word. They called them low docs. It's just an ordinary mortgage you think is principal and interest. When you get a mortgage, you think it's naturally principal and interest. That's how you all paid your houses off. So nobody knew this was going to be a stitch up on a bridging loan lasting 30 years. But as you'll find out as we go through this, there was only one opportunity to pay this off and you had to do it within five years because of the codicils and the other uh, statements in the contract. But you were only given four minutes to sign the contract on the yellow stickers. Very slick. Very slick. So how did I know that? Gathering people together from all states in Australia and New Zealand and America and England and a few rang me from Ireland, I started to work out it's all the same system. And the banks are going to turn around and say, can you bail us out, please, guys? We don't need a glass staggle. We got very good regulators. <laughs> They're actually such good puppets, they will bark on command. <laughs> so they're going to use the tools to deceive the people. They're going to manipulate the data on the loan application forms, the application you fill out in order to get a mortgage, don't you? But guess what? The three pages you're given is really an 11-page document. They just don't show you the other eight pages, but we'll, we'll go into that a bit later. So the measure, how widespread is this? It's, it's pretty horrific. APRA has now been dragged screaming and kicking into the limelight a year and a half ago to say, well, we're up to about 40%. Well, that's encouraging because at the height of the GFC, I noted that America banks, who lie as well, but they and they own a fair bit of our banks, but they told the regulators and the whole of the American people, we, we only did 25% of these dodgy loans. APRA say, 
We only did 40%. Oh, well, we're climbing up a bit. I'm telling you now, I speak to the brokers, the people on the ground, the, the ma bank managers that sell this product that didn't know it was a fraud that got caught themselves. And that is what our talk today is about in this part too. It's about the brokers are not to blame you being had again. It's a lie. It's a public lie put out there to deceive you again. Let's blame a few brokers. The brokers wouldn't have been able to make this up. They can't collude. They didn't put the, the documents together in order to deceive you. No, there's something much, much higher going on here. Like the ones, you think the banks are in te, the bank CEOs are in 10 million a year? How much do they earn? Well, see, they're in for five years and it's a bit of a wrong... 18 million, he did too. Yes, that's right. But that's a long time ago. But no, this day and age, they, he got more than that, by the way. I'll explain how. Yeah, of course you know that. Yes, 150 million for five years' work. Is that okay with you? No. Well, it's okay with them. 150 million. Because, see, they get 10 million because that looks a bit rough, but the public will wear that. The shareholders, more importantly, will wear that. But we're making them lots of lonely money. They don't know it's a fraud, but that won't matter. But what we're going to do is get 100 million for being good boys for five years and then we're whiz off wherever we want to go. 150 million per person, per CEO. So we've got to look inside and we've got to ask why, and it's a massive fraud and it's widespread across Australia. So what we did was we had the kindly lady there in her little cottage. That's what I want you to get the picture in your mind. That was the target market. Might be there for the next 10 years, then we'll, we'll have her house and the kids get no inheritance. And they don't work it out and come to me until she's passed on. So simple. So, banks are there. How many, how many houses could we hit on? How many retire? Now, you know we got double retirees now, don't you, in figures? Because we're living longer, so the last lot haven't passed on when they were supposed to, right? So you've got twice as many. Okay, that's the statistics of it. But the banks saw that as a marvellous opportunity to pick up more houses, if we raped and pillaged and plundered everybody to just grab one thing, the asset, is there a law against this? Yeah, don't bother lobbying about the laws. The laws are there. What you've got to lobby the government is make sure they put these guys in jail because it's a criminal offence to grab somebody's asset. It's called asset stripping. It has a name. And the asset stripped means if they took that house off you without explaining the risks, then are they not going to tell this lady the risks, are they? She would say, no, dear, I'm not getting involved in that. So she's not told any of the mechanics of this fraud at all. It's so simple. So all those that suddenly think, well, if people... That was the rhetoric from the banks and the government. If people are silly old moes and they fall for this, they deserve what they get. Well, not in my book. I told my mother... She, my poor parents have passed on, but they, I probably gave them too much trouble. But the point is that they... I told mum... If somebody comes down the garden path and he's wearing a nice suit and he speaks nicely and he's going to talk to you about the house, you lock every door and every window and you do not let him in. And I know you, you'll say, oh, he looks at He speaks so beautifully. <laughs> My mother aspired to be an elocutionist and I failed. But the point was that the... Um, I said to her, if a guy comes down with a bottle of clava and he's sneaking with a torch around the house, let him in, give him a cup of tea, at least you know what he wants. <laughs> Gee whiz. But can I get out and tell the whole of the population? That not really, I'd probably be locked up myself. All right, so the point was the banker had his eye on the money and the mortgage broker was just... Very average. There's 41,000 of them. And they want you to think that they're the problem. But they can't fire anybody because the broker might, through Denise Braley, work it out and then come back and use it against the banks. 
So they keep them all going. Because why? Their purpose is three things. Just grab as many people in, give them the bank financial strategy to wealth, let them fall for it, and just get three signatures on three pieces of paper. And then we'll give you a pot of two, two, three grand in commissions. And then go out and get the next one. And you've got a quota. You've got to catch at least 10 fish a month. Volume. Big volume. But there's a little figure in there the banks and the government have got to mention. That's called 45%. 45% of these brokers, uh, sorry, 45% of the sellers are, are brokers. The other people, 55%, are the bank managers. They don't know what the fraud is either. How do I know that? They come to me and say, oh, golly gosh, Denise, I'm a bit worried. I didn't know all this. I'll bet the biggest readers of my, or watchers of my YouTubes now are, are the bankers, the sellers, the bank managers and the brokers. Because they've worn the blame, have they not? Have you noticed that? Oh, we've got a few rogues in our midst. Well, we certainly do, but they're not at the bottom level. They're at the top level on the 140 million. All right, so then you've got ASIC doing absolutely nothing, saying they're going to have a little uh, time at putting uh, a microscope to it, and we're doing a deep dive, a deep dive. And, of course, the, the consumer, the poor little consumer, has no idea what he's done, and he's done like a dinner. So the bankers. The bankers are the ones that are causing this problem. They set up a Ponzi scheme. Anyone know what a Ponzi is? Anyone know who Charles Ponzi is? Go home and get Google. Charles Ponzi, P-O-N-Z-I. Ponzi is where you rob this person, we're going to rob everybody on this side of the room and give it to all these people. And in the meantime, we're going to reap our share of the profits. Now, if you think the banks are not doing that, think again. That's exactly what they're doing. So they train these people that are sellers to go out and sell and ring people up on the phone one night and say, look, we can help. You're on a pension. We can help manage. How do you think they got all these names to give a call or a visit the things? The banks gave them the list, the credit card lists. How do I know that? A mother rang me and said she was a bit worried her son had been hired as a spruker in order to get, go through the lists and ring up these old people to make her make an um, uh, appointment to come round and talk to them about financial security. Very slick, very nasty. Did they invite me to the Royal Commission? Not really. <laughs> you just have to wonder why that was. Right. So what they're doing, and do you notice the government the last few years has changed everything into buyer beware? Yeah. Have you noticed that? We got consumer protection laws coming out of our ears, have we not? We don't have to lobby for new ones of those, do we? We just have to apply it. But no, let's bury the, says the, the government, well, let's bury those nasty little laws in the basement of ASIC. And we won't, we'll tell ASIC, they get, between APRA and ASIC, they get about one point billion a year to run their wretched, wretched little organisations that don't protect us at all. But we'll put it in the basement and collect dust, and that way no one, and when you're ripped off, you haven't got any money left to get a lawyer, have you? And anyway, you can be ripped off by the lawyer as well, so there we go. <laughs> so, you didn't have to agree with that. <laughs> and then the bankers decided to create this calculator and the calculator was going to calculate a new income for the loan application form. But remember, I'm saying there were three pages to the loan application form, which I'll now call the laugh. There are three pages to the laugh, but they didn't know the broker, and he didn't know either. He's told to go back to his office and write the other eight pages out and put those eight pages together with this three, and there's two pages to the service calculator, so it's about a 13-page document by now, and we'll just send it all into the bank processing centre. So the bank BDMs, business development managers, they teach them. The BDMs teach the sellers what to do with the paperwork and just send it in. And if you send it in, you make about three grand a time. Go and get another customer, right? That's how it works. 
So the point is that they then, what, this is what people don't understand in Australia, and it's starting to come out now. Did you think there was somebody in the bank called a credit assessor that was verifying verification of the details on this document? Did you think that? Would it surprise you to know they got rid of those in 2001, our little major banks? They don't have people assessing anything. They send it to the robot, and the robot just goes bang, bang, approved, approved, approved. The robot approves it all, every loan. Now, one seller told me she was riding around on a a la golf course and had the... Uh, at the expense of one of the major banks, it was CBA actually, and the CBA manager jumped in the cart with her. They all wanted to get in the cart with her simply because she was one of the biggest uh, writers of business in Australia at that time. And then they turned on her to send her to jail for three years and one month. And before that, she only had worked there for four years. But she was a head on a stick but they told her things in the cart they shouldn't have done. Oh, just never mind about all this, just push them through one after the other because they'll all get approved. We don't reject any loan, none. And she was one of the star performers. I won't go down that track because that's not a, a thing for some other day. But in the end, what I'm making a big deal out of it is the actual thing of the, all these people are just being dangled on a string by the banks and they're making lots of money and you end up within five years coming to me because your house is in jeopardy. So how do people believe that they could possibly think about paying for these loans, 500 grand loan average? How did they think on a pension they could pay for it? Easy. The bank gives them an extra 50 grand to pay the payments with. If there's a shortfall, we won't even go there. But that was a good one. So I'm giving you this little quote because I'm a good reader of William K. Black in any case. And he wrote this fantastic reversion of his book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. You should get a copy. He is a very impressive United States economist. But he writes with flair and I like it. And he's got done classic investigations into bank fraud. So he said, the idea we will achieve financial stability by leaving frauds in charge of the largest banks is delusional. The absence of criminal fraud, referrals of control frauds by banking regulators, and he's talking about the FBI, provided only a pittance of agents to look, not look too closely, and investigate the epidemic of mortgage fraud. In 2004, the FBI actually warned of a potential collapse and hello, GFC. We're heading that way and we just don't know it. So ASIC's deep diving technique, (laughs) this was just to keep the head in the sand. When they know that I'm coming in there to have a word with the commissioners, they just go clunk. You know, they just haven't really understood. They don't, they, they don't quite understand it themselves, but whatever they do understand, they don't want to know because they're told what to do. That's what's happening. So it's heads you win, and tell, a heads you lose and tells we win, and, and whatever it is, and they're really making a lot of money out of it. So the 20 years of deregulation, because that's what we've had, de-supervision, Everybody on buyer beware should be responsible for their own finances. That was the policy. That's how it got went away for so long. You thought ASIC was there to protect you if something was really wrong. Hundreds of, th- well, several thousand letters went into ASIC and they just got a bugger off letter back saying, well, get a lawyer, go to court, don't worry us, or go to FOSS, the Ombudsman Service. And that was just as much a disaster. So what we've got is economists know deregulation, de-supervision is dangerous. Regulators refuse to close down the control fraud. They just gather in a ring, throw all the money in the centre. And did anyone here know that ASIC had performance bonuses at the top? 
They wouldn't even know how to perform in a circus. <laughs> Understanding the Ponzi structure will lead to an ultimate collapse of the property market. The asset stripping, criminal offence, is targeting people with assets, knowing the risk, but not passing on that knowledge. The control fraud eventually runs out of people. Ponzi's run out of people. So def de definition and elements of fraud. The fraud means dishonestly making a false or misleading representation with a view to gain or intention to cause loss, contracts obtained by deception, and misrepresentations were made willfully and intentionally, and risk is known to the seller only after the horse has bolted. And there's no mention of risk in the initial process of selling you this product. So it's the sellers that are coming to me now, if that sounds a bit ambiguous, the sellers are coming to me now and saying, we now understand what was going on. But we didn't know that when we sold it. Banks didn't tell us. The bankers are running a cartel. I don't use these words lightly. I mean, I look after poor old Craig here. I mean, <laughs> the, banker, the documents don't lie. This is not anecdotal. This is pure, hard documents in big bundles to the Senate inquiries, which I lobbied for. How many Senate inquiries have you good people paid for so far? 24. Are you kidding? I wasn't pissed off that we wanted a royal commission. We needed a royal commission and we got one. Was it the best that they could deliver? No. Do we need a royal commission mark two? You will see why shortly. So the fraud invented by the engineers of the product, the fraud was carried out by the broker agents and the sellers, yes, but they didn't know it was a fraud. The fraud driven by payment system of commissions, so they were all animated in order to sell, sell, sell on quotas or they lose their job. And why would the regulators receive a performance bonus? ASIC now admitting the bankers had a conflict of interest in running every facet of the Ponzi financing structure. And the conflict was easy to understand. ASIC is supposed to look for conflict of interest, but ASIC's got the conflict of interest. How can it balance the interest of the banks on one hand with the interest of consumers? Philip Hanratty wrote a paper on that in 1997, which I've read. The government didn't take any notice. So we've got manufacturers, marketers, and retail merchants now all with inside the banking structure. They're Mr. Everything in there, are they not? They're running the super, they invaded the insurance industry, and that you've seen bits of this come out in the Royal Commission. So the bank says, off the pension and become self-funded retirees. We'll show you how. Oh, well, it'll only cost you a cup of coffee. That's all right. Come on round seven o'clock. Bang, you're gone. No seller leaves the home without three, three signatures on three bits of paper. And you've just given away your house. Now, they tell the people they've got to be able to buy a home in another state to that which they live. Did you know every one of these victims bought a house in an opposite state to where they lived? Sight unseen. Would you do that? How silly is that? So the first reaction of the general population that wasn't stung by this scandal is, well, silly old moves deserve what they get. I mean, who would buy a property in another state sight unseen? This, I am saying to you, is the power of the bank's persuasion to get people to do this en masse in Australia. Is that going to affect our economy? Yes. Is that going to affect every head in this room? Yes. That's why I'm letting you know that bit. Do they feel very, very guilty? Do they feel <laughs> utterly stressed? You'll bring me to tears if I go down that path. It is mind-blowing. We had to save a wife, two children, from a man who was desperately unhappy that I received a suicide warning and we were worried about a whole thing. So he was the sort of guy I loved his family so much. I knew that after two years of dealing with them. The bank kept saying no. And so we got this letter and it, it had a better ending, let me tell you. 
but it could have had a much worse ending because he would have taken his wife and kids with him, we think. We don't know. But the letter was one of the worst I've ever seen. These are real people. And they're blokes that have worked all their lives and they don't know how to deal with this. And guys, well, you're not really good at chatting to each other, are you? Confiding in this stuff. The women will, but the guys are not so good at doing it. They won't have the conversation about it. It's a bit embarrassing. But it's happening in probably every street you know near you. Someone is caught in this cycle. So trust the bank experts. That's what they did. They thought they were trusting the bank experts. So you've got target markets, and they are ARIPs, asset rich, income poor. Is that my acronym for these people? No, it's the bank acronym. They called them ARIPs. How do I know? I was in a bank meeting front row as a VIP between the two heads of the bank. And here they are with Peter Costello as the speaker saying, go after these people that have got, uh, 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 have got a, a large property. And they use Chatswood as an analogy. They're on a large block of land in Sydney, this was. And, and ask them, do they want a better life than staying there in a million dollar home that needs renovating? That's how it was done. It's pretty despicable. Pretty despicable. Not how I was brought up, I can tell you. So these people were on low income but had no debt. No worries. Within five years of this, they're thinking suicide. They're stressed. They're losing their home. They're going to be thrown out in the street. They weren't prepared for this. This is not what the bank said, trust me, and this is what's going to happen to you. In 30 years' time, this property will be so worth so much, and another property you're going to buy sight unseen will be worth so much because Australia is booming, and, and your kids are going to get twice as much. Every trick in the book that is grimy is used in this story. Then the sellers, they told them to go out and practice on their parents first. Well, that brings in a first wave of houses, doesn't it? Grabbing assets of ordinary working people has to matter to the all, every Australian. Has to matter. And, of course, they're told, trust us, we're the, we are the experts. And then they carry off the home and you're left with nothing. So we've got consumers now. So there's lots of characters in this. There's the bankers, the sellers, the regulators. We've got the consumers. And they've got houses in each of these areas, they're all different. These people come from all walks of life. They're not usually in the major cities with big properties, I might add. They're mostly, the target market was more in the country where they had less equity. So their equity at the time would have been about three, 400,000. Use that to buy um, another house in another state that was 500. And the banks thought all this up and they allowed the fact that then somebody would either be left in a tent or I know one person in Sydney that lived for eight months after he was thrown out of his house in a cave. Keeper can't cope with this. Now, I'm not very good when people ring up to give me a sad story on the sense they need some counselling. I keep telling them brutally, I'm not your counsellor. I can't deal with this. I'm a busy person. I've only got time to lead you into writing a letter to the CEO with the actual evidence and facts and stick it up him. So we then had the farmers from up in Queensland decide, right, we've had enough of this. They give me a recall on the phone and down they come. They went down to the city on their horses and said, right, and they dumped manure somewhere on, on somebody's <laughs> parliamentary steps and they did... <coughs> excuse me, all sorts of things to say we're not sticking any of, we're not going with this at all. So the ASIC warnings that never came, ASIC knew all this. I had 30 meetings with the chairman. I would say to them, this is not my job. This is your job. I'm four or five hundred grand a year. <coughs> oh, yes, Denise, but what do you want us to do about this? I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. And, of course, then we took it to the media for years. 
and they played ball. But have you noticed the media's gone quiet the last couple of years? We've all noticed that capture. That's part of the control for all, of course, it is. These are key indicators all over the place. They put in Medcraft there. And Medcraft was the starter of the Securitization Association in America that you see in the big short. Ah, yeah, this is all coming out of Goldman Sachs. And the current James Shepton, another one refugee from Goldman Sachs. And he ought to have given this warning to the consumers. You voluntary, this is what they should have said to the people, you voluntary loan your home to our bank for our benefit, but we will pass the risk of your homelessness back to you and we will blame you. But did they tell them that in the interview? No. They be our bankers have become merchant banks. Do we need to break up the banks, as Craig is saying? Of course they do. We've got to make this happen. Can we be better than Iceland and put these people in jail? I think we can. I, I have... Most of us somehow come, or an extended family come from, from the convicts in the first place. They wouldn't have stood a bar for this. Absolutely, yeah. Gentleman's saying we could have gone to jail for stealing a motor car, and this is happening on a huge scale. They will offer you a low-dock, unaffordable loan, so you don't know it's an interest only. You're told it's a low-dock, the same as the mortgage. It just needs a few less documents. That's how it's sold. So the sellers ring me up and say, well, we were told to practice on our parents first, and bang, went the house. The bankers will design a specific strategy they erroneously say is tailored to your needs. Now, I mentioned Mr. Ponzi. He was, by about the 1930s, the early 30s, I know there were 10,000 people to see him get on a boat and be thrown out of the country eventually. There's pictures of that in, was it San Francisco? Where, wherever it was. Sent him packing. And he went over to be a financial advisor for Mussolini, but what can I say? And then he still went off to the, uh, South Africa and did a few things down there. But he was in and out of jail most of his life. He just took, stole other people's money. But he ended up stealing the bank at one stage. He actually owned a bank. And the reason he was able to buy a bank because he ripped off two-thirds of the Boston police force. Now, that wasn't really a good career move in hindsight. <laughs> So the bank response, oh, it's just a few irresponsible brokers. We're cleaning up this industry. So Ponzi financing is robbing one person to pay another, and each fraudulent loan, the bank profit within five years, about 170 grand on every $360,000 house. The house you buy sight unseen... We'll help you source the property so you get the best advantage of the best price. Rubbish. They're all $150,000 over value, which means you're borrowing another one hundred and fifty and paying interest on that borrowing uh, to bring your uh, level of debt up to five hundred grand. Wiped out. This is real stuff, real time, Australia, right now. And it's still being sold right now. How do I know that? I've asked the sellers one question the last few months in particular. Have the quotas been lowered? No, no, Denise, we're, no, we've, we've still got to keep the quotas going. Nothing like that. Have you been told to stop selling interest-only loans? No, that's the main push. We're told by the banks we've got to sell as many of those as we can. Right now. So the brokers did not know of the fraud, which is what I'm getting at here. The banks say it's compulsory. ASIC say it's just a tool. The trust in the bank is gone, has it not? I mean, there are those that are still worried about if they've got money in the bank, the, the bail-in is going to take 10% of all their savings that way. In other words, they're still intent, the government, on making you pay to try and prop the banks up to keep going. But the biggest problem that the world isn't seeing yet, the banks will collapse eventually. Why? Because they've got nothing else to sell except dud loans. That's what got America in the, the soup, did it not? 
But our government was saying, no, no, it's not happening here. No, our Pranasic report to us every week and they tell us there's nothing to worry about. And the thing that really got me, no, I'll go through that, I won't jump a slide. I'll tell you what they were saying later. The brokers and managers asked to source new customers. It, the quotas kept going to fill in the three-page loan application form, get the basic details or from the customer over the phone. You, spe you give them three pages for signing. But there was a fourth page it was a stat deck, and I thought, people said to me, but Denise, I would never have so signed that document, that fourth page. I never saw it. I wouldn't have signed it. But your signature's on it. What they were doing was using e-signatures, electronic. And it said, yes, I agree. I'm on a pension, but I earn 200 grand a year. <laughs> on with the next customer and tracker, and the tracker was the system, the inc that's where I cracked it, was the getting hold of the tracker, which is, and I used to be a computer programmer, so that made it very convenient for me. And the tracker, the minute I saw the tracker, I realized we got some real serious stuff here. So the customer was told about the um, uh, calculator, but the calculator was a key tool to alter the income. So if you told them your income was Combined household income was about 20 to 50 grand. They're usually in that bracket, 20 to 50 grand. Suddenly you'd find when you get your laugh four or five years because you've met me and I tell you to get, grab that document. You're not given a copy. And they look at it and say, oh, Denise, you'll never guess what I found. And I think, oh, yes, I will. And, of course, they're, they're put down as anything from 120 to 150. So I spoke to the brokers. What made you put 120,000 on this person's loan application for no, I didn't. The computer did it. The bank, the bank has a computer, a calculator. I thought, yeah, just tell me. Just, I'm a bit dumb. Just explain. Well, the calculator has to include the negative gearing. It has to include the ad backs and the ad banks. It's all very complicated. Even I don't understand it. But we just press a button and it spits out this income and we put that income on the form. That's how we're taught. Every seller in Australia was doing that. Every loan application form, you didn't get a copy, but when you did, you found the income exaggerated by goodness knows how much. So I'll come to that in a moment. So I was explaining about the service calculator. So it's all about a black box. There's fraud in the laugh. We know that. Then I've got to teach these people. They get excited about the fraud on the laugh. This is a crime scene. I said, no, the fraud on the laugh is just a key little indicator. The big fraud is in the approval process. Remember I said no verification, no credit assessors? That's where the fraud is, in the robot. That way the banks could say, oh, but we didn't know that. It was a bit of an error because the robot did it. <laughs> Heard that lately in so many different words? Yes, absolutely. And they were talking about that in the Royal Commission. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the algorithms. Yes, we got a technician in our group. Yes. <laughs> the, it's, it, that comes from much higher up. Much higher up. So that they don't quite know. They're only told to use the accounting formula that an accountant would use on someone where you didn't know the income, but you could work out what the answer would be. That's how they pulled it off. All right? it, it's, it's so sophisticated. So that not even the data process, and remember how, well, in banking years ago, you used to have one person look through the laugh and assess it, and then he'd get on to the next one. No, this tracker, which we'll get to in a moment, is one line after the other, tracked, dated, time, name of staffer, name of entry clerk, and then it says a few lines down, so they're just feeding in what's in the laugh, donkey fashion, into the tracker, one line at a time for all the accountants in the room. And then you get to a line that says, system override. And that's how every loan gets approved. Because if the lower levels push the button and it doesn't come out with the big words, congratulations, servicing fits, 
and then they send that off as an email to the seller saying, congratulations, move on to the next one, you've just got yourself a sale. It's been approved. So they were all approved, every bit of paper. The computer was, the algorithms were only geared to look at one thing. Did they have an asset? And how much was that asset worth? And there, ladies and gentlemen, is your asset stripping. So it's all fed into the computer by a load of clerks who don't know what the fraud is. It's right at the top that the algorithms are coming from. And, and as a computer program, for those that are in the room, yeah, it's like the old four next stoops. You know, it's what you put into the system that the computer is looking for. So its brain is your logic. And you give it a certain set of algorithms and your logic, it will come out with the answer you want it to do. Good? Getting a few nods in there? Understood what I said? Yeah, good. So the tracker, the computerized tracker, is, is actually you can print out the document, but it tracks the loan only for three weeks from the time the victim is brought into the vortex and the loan application is sent to the processing center by the sellers and the calculator alters the income. That's the first step. This is why there's calls now for neg gearing to be scrapped, is there not? Well, of course there has to be. It's being misused by the banks. If you, you pull the rug out from under the banks by just altering the fact you can't use neg gearing in their algorithms, but it's still going to take experts, not ASIC and APRA dumbos, to go in there and work out what you do in order to get this properly addressed. But the valuations on the asset are manipulated. The asset must be present or it won't work. So this was not being sold to young people looking for a house. Oh, no, we killed all that for them years ago, did we not? Two decades of young people can't afford to buy a house, except with mum and dad. So the income is exaggerated, the expense underestimated, the approval given by a robot, and the loan fits servicing. So we've got ASIC blaming the brokers. And ASIC's doing funny little things there. And it's saying for the banks to continue Ponzi financing, you've got to escalate the sales of non-prime product and control fraud because it needs to survive. The banks will collapse without this. So the Scheller Channel kept active on high quotas. And the grand plan was always to blame the consumers. Have you noticed? Ah, oh, silly old moose. And blame the sellers. But only not too many because most of our sellers are good people. So you've got scapegoats there that ASIC pings now and again. They ping 10 a year for doing that. There's a whole army of 41,000 doing it. ASIC blamed the brokers for mis-selling. They're not told what the product is. ASIC pushed the buyer beware approach. ASIC hide the fact that 55% of all loans are sold by bank managers. So why have they got the same fraud? The same outcomes. And every non-prime loan has fraud. 80% of the loan books, we say, are poisoned by this fraud. So is it just a few rogue brokers? No, I don't think so. And the ombudsman lie. Uh, I wrote a 14-page report late last year and was part of the uh, parliamentary uh, think tank for that group with Ian Ramsey. And I can assure you, um, I just wrote a 14-page report why... FOSS needs to be demolished. So the government responded and it set up a new thing called AFCA, which for the last three weeks it's been running is putting out the same crap we've had before. So I'm less than impressed. It's more work for me. So the point is we've got ASIC going to sleep and hiding in its shell whenever the, the, fire, the, the, the thick of the fire gets too hot. And we continue with this free market policy. Now, free market policy has good things, does it not? But not if it's not regulated or controlled or there's oversight of what they're doing. They can easily bankrupt the country if we don't watch what these big financiers are doing. So we ask the taxpayers to bail out the wrongdoers. No. No, we don't do that. Do nothing to diminish the risk. The business practices continue. The bankers continue to engineer the bad products, products and there's no repercussions. And there's performance bonuses, as I said, for the regulators. So the moral hazard is to the economy. 
So then when you get to this level of theft of property, are you understanding now how your properties all rose with, with um, uh, like on, a, on command, gone up through the stratosphere? Fraud must be treated as a criminal offence, not as a misdemeanour or an error. These are not errors. This was cold calculated, white collar crime on a massive level. And Medcraft had the last laugh. When he left Australia, he just said, or left that position, he just said, this is the white collar crime haven of the world. Not wrong. All the major dollars are over in the Caymans by now. So the solution, the people demand criminal change be laid against those responsible. Jail sentences for the cartel members. And they, uh, you've got to restrict the banks to only selling safe products. So there's eight scams I'm going to run through quickly inside a banking scandal. One is the loan application form I've mentioned. One is the service calculator fraud. One is the credit card fraud. One is the LMI fraud, loan, mor loan mortgage insurance. Oh, that's a little gem all on its own, another little money earner for our crooked mates. And the loan-to-value ratio fraud, the manipulation of the loan-to-value ratio on the investment property. And then they had another little scam running for a while, not now, but it was called ABNs for a day. These were supposed to be business loans. We'll just create a business loan for somebody that's 80 years old and she's going to be a landscape gardener, shoveling rocks. <laughs> We had another one where the guy was a, was a deckhand and they crossed that out and put ship's captain. <laughs> well, see, it's simple arithmetic. If you've then had the calculators told you to write 200 grand income and you tell them he's a, a deckhand, something's wrong and the tax department will get involved and we don't want that. So I took all these documents to the tax office in 2005. Is that impressive? They were going to come out for the government at the time and say, look, I th what we're going to do, we put out this report that all these people are lying on their loan application forms. All these Australians, decent people all their lives, they've been liars, liar loans. Did you hear that term? <laughs> liars. Oh, they're doing that to the Chinese because they ripped them off the same way, but that's another story for another day. And we went to Mumbai and did the same thing to the Indians. God knows what helped we've got when they all start figuring it out that we're the biggest rip-offs merchants in the whole bloody global system. So the point was that the e-signatures on the fraud are the, on the income declaration form are just another example of these particular frauds in order to bring all the ends together just so you've got approved, 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 approved. Ask the banks how many approvals they push through a day. It's frightening. The cartel structure was masterminded uh, by these um, people. So the loan application form, I've virtually given you in advance a little bit about that, but no customer in Australia was permitted to fill out their own loan. What, are we all stupid? We can't fill out a form? But see, if you'd been a, that's right. If you'd been allowed to fill out your own form, you would put the truth on it, would you not? And then it wouldn't work, and you'd be rejected. You've only got a house. You've only got twenty grand income a year, or thirty. That wouldn't work. No customer was allowed to fill out their form and no copy given to the customer. So in 2005, I started really pushing the government to give us a copy, everybody a copy. They're still not doing it. They do when I get on the phone, believe me, I get them out, but it's hard work. And I teach other people how to do that. There's tricks to it as well. But the service calculator fraud... You don't have to read all these figures at the moment, but it'll give you an idea. They're not just manipulating the income, all right? What they're doing is they're manipulating the expenses. Now, these are the actual expenses of the cost of living for two adults and uh, two children. So guess what the brokers were taught to do? If there's children, just don't put them down in the little box. So someone with six kids, the six kids have automatically disappeared. They might enjoy that for a weekend, but they aren't too impressed. 
And of course, they don't get copies, so they don't see this till I point it out to them. Oh, Denise, you never get swat. Our kids have all disappeared. Because in the cost of living, you've got to feed them, haven't you? Well, you don't want to put that figure in the cost of living to work out whether you can approve the loan. It's manipulated not just the income. It's manipulated the expenses. Guess what they put in instead of those figures? They put in the Henderson Poverty Index. Now, later somebody will argue it's the HEM, the, the, uh, the household uh, expenditure measure. Uh, no, that didn't come into 2011. Prior to that, they were using the HBR. And I know what they're using because some figures in both studies of income and expenses are slightly different in age groups. So they just manipulate that and use the HEM and the HBI, the banks, whichever is the lowest, because they want the figure to be the lowest to make the servicing fit. When you're a victim, you start to learn this really fast, I'm telling you. So they're supposed to look at what you can afford. Instead, they tell you everything is affordable. So the expense fraud, because that's what it is, an expense fraud. Before 2010, the cost of living was generally about 40000 in reality, and after 2010, about 52000 But the HEM or the HPI, whichever you want, you can see the differences there between the HEM and the HPI at that particular point in time. And that's how they manoeuvred it. And HPI is mostly written on the laugh, because the sellers are taught to write whether they're using the HPI or the M for the computer's benefit, so I know what they're using. So ASIC, 2005 to 2016, they decided, right, we'll help the banks a little bit more because they already knew of my work out there at this time. We'll just tighten things up a little bit to make it look a little better. What we'll do is all those brokers that were selling product didn't have a license. They had a license, but not to get your personal documents. You know where you've got to produce your ID documents? You can't give them to a broker. He's not likely licensed to do that. He's also, his license is only really a rubber stamp. He's not trained to help you with your finances at all. They don't want him to be that bright or her. But we'll ASIC, the only little bit of work it's done for 15 years if they're in the room, the only bit of work they did was they gave the class order C01122-05 in May 05. Who knew about that one? No, hidden in the bowels of their dungeons in there, in their archives, and it was not in the consumer best interest. This classic class order exempted banks and their sellers from prosecution. ASIC gave them a free get-out-of-jail card to make sure from 2005 over to 2016, none of that would come to light. So what made them change this in 2016, says me? That was the announcement that I'd fought for so long, for 18 years, for a royal commission, because I was fed up of writing reports to the Senate and everybody, and giving evidence in Canberra many times to the senators and, and the House of Reps. They hastily withdrew so it would be buried in the archives and you wouldn't even know if I wasn't there that it even existed. So it meant that any time after 2006, any of these loans, ASIC could have gone in then and said, right, well, the exemption no longer applies, so we're now coming in to prosecute. Do they do so? No, not at all, not in your Nelly. So then the low mortgage insurance was where they decided, right, you need an insurance policy on your mortgage. Did you have one at some stage? Yeah. You did. What, in case you suddenly lost your job? It was common sense, wasn't it? No, this low mortgage insurance is another scam. They, they own the policy. The, the policy holder is the bank. You're not allowed to see it because it's the bank's property. But we'll make you pay for it. So they started to hit the I.O. Uh, buyers of loans with a roughly about $12,000, uh, sorry, um, in the early days, four to $5,000 for insurance that they could never claim on. Really good stuff. So then ASIC got wind of this, partly because of my digging, I agree, but ASIC got wind and decided 
that what they would do is we will make sure that everybody that gets one of these, uh, that gets a, a consumer, QBE was one of the major provisors of insurance. And I had a 2001 copy of its policy. That's how far back it goes. And it had a line in there, if there's fraud on the laugh, the claim will be rejected. So that shows they already knew about fraud on the laugh. 2001. So they then go and have a little word with ASIC. How do I know I'm face to face with the commissioners yet again? And said, what about this low mortgage insurance? Oh no, but the banks told us that if we didn't, if they didn't use QBE or GE money anymore, then this will be a lot, um, this will be a lot better for you, right? This will be uh, cheaper because we don't have the overhead. Uh, you know, the banks can make the policy payment cheaper. So over the next five or six years, I saw from this point of time, I saw that these policies, the consumers on their statement for the loan were being charged a magnificent $10,000 to $20,000 for loan mortgage insurance they cannot claim on. Then the stip up, stitch up with the ombudsman comes. Yeah, oh, you go and complain to the ombudsman. That's what it's there for. No, they're paid by the banks five grand a person to stitch them up again. And I had three meetings with the ombudsman. They're nice people. I just sit there and talk to Philip and we have a nice cup of coffee and we agree to disagree. And now he's made the chief ombudsman at AFCO. What can I say? So the point is the consumers had nowhere to go they could trust because it was all controlled as a control fraud by the banks. So the borrowers were denied the claim on the loan mortgage insurance. The banks approved an unaffordable loan. The banks insist the customers pay loan mortgage insurance so that they said you can have a hardship payment. If you're stuck for three months because you haven't got a job, we'll give you a holiday. Oh, that's good. We get about 10 grand where that 10 grand pays the payments for us and we don't have to worry or stress. Oh, rubbish. There was a sting in the tail there. What did we find the sting was? So my, my members across Australia start. oh, Denise, you'll never guess what I found. They stitched us up again. It's tacked onto the loan. So where you owed 550 to the bank with the buffer money of 50 grand, you now owe uh, an extra 10 or 20 on top of that of whatever you got. And you can only use that three times in the life of the loan. So they can stitch you up for another guarantee, 30,000, with compounding interest. So the bank, the borrowers were denied the claim on the loan mortgage insurance, and it's a risk policy. And what I found out there was there was a and, and Robbie knows more about this than than I'm going to suggest at the moment. But there there are mechanisms in place where, of course, the bank has to have insurance as a risk on its own business. Does it not? Those that know how that works, yes. And. What happens is APRA is supposed to police that, that they are having insurance to stop any risk on any products they might sell. But they're getting the consumers to pay their risk insurance payments. It's not coming out of their pay packet, I can tell you. So the loan to value ratio, that's a good one. That's another manipulation within the scam, within the system. If you pay a deposit, say, of 20%, you need to cross-collateralize the loan. Did you know that if you were a person that owned your own home and you had 20% deposit to go and buy another house, as some of them did in their super money, a small bit of super left in the bank, if they'd have done that, the house would not have been in danger. But the bank needed you to have your house in danger so they could steal it later on. So no one was allowed to put in a deposit when they're buying sight unseen in another state. This is wicked, really wicked. So the banks say no need for a deposit. The home is worth, say, 500 grand. The bank debt is 430. Add the home to the asset, and that's a total of 930,000. And for those that understand loan-to-value ratio, it's 47.7% LVR. 
But if they just bought the house that they were tricked into buying that was worth 150 grand more than they were told at that time by the bank, sight unseen in another state, the LVR would have been 134. But every document in every customer loan file in the whole of Australia says, oh, it's between 47 and 60% LVR. It's not a risk. It is a risk if this means that person is, their customer, their customer is going to lose their home because they've been stitched up by the banks they trusted. Oh, and the credit card fraud is a good one. I'll only just go that in briefly, but the credit card is where, did you know if you've got a mortgage home loan and you've got a credit card, the banks know the loan approved is unaffordable, but they give everybody a card with the package. How, what, what is the credit card limit, limit on that card? $25,000 each. Just handing them out like 25 grand. Anybody else for 25 grand? And some of them are 50 grand and some of them are 100 grand. And this is how they give you, because they, they say, oh no dear, I've got two cards already. I don't need a third or I've, I've never used cards. I don't want one. Oh, just put it in the drawer. Don't use it then. Because they know they've stitched these people up, so they want these people to really... It's like paying a house off on steroids if you use a credit card to pay it off. But they know when the buffers run out, they've got to keep you going for five years. Why? Because they've stacked all these loans into residential mortgage-backed securities. We're not going there today, but that'll be a theme for another day. This is big stuff, real big stuff. So the Australian business number, I mentioned that. I've already been through that for you. So there's the e-signature. Yeah, they were just using e-signatures because if you get your signature on two or three pages, you put it into the computer, you know you can then use it on another document they've never even seen. Good one? Yeah. Well, ASIC said to these people in writing in letters that complained to ASIC, well, hang, hang on, but it's your signature. So you signed it. They've even presented it to court and the judge is thinking, well, she's admitted she signed it. But she can't recall it. She, she don't recall seeing it. Oh, that's because she's a bit short of memory. <laughs> this is just wicked. If it was your mother, you'd be crying. I'd hope. Or your dad. And the, I've often said the men feel it the most. They're the money keepers. It's just a dreadful, dreadful thing I'm talking about. I got a lot of humour with it. But it's no laughing matter what's been happening. So the cartel. Yes, we don't have a cartel. No. So I wrote, a, I was so frustrated with the Royal Commission. They're not going to call me in there. I know that. They're told to do a quickie. They're told, uh, and, and I've got utmost faith in Hain as, uh, in terms of an, his intellect, his intelligence, his decency as a judge. Rowena Orr is a star. The point is, these are just doing their job. They were hampered by a ridiculous low terms of reference. Below community expectations. Did you hear that a few times? Yeah. Below community expectations. Well, there's no crime in being below community expectations. A lot of people are. So there's no criminal, there's no way that Hank can find a criminal offence committed because he's not entitled to look there. He's restricted by this terms of reference. Remember when the Prime Minister came out a few weeks ago and said, oh, it's up to the Royal Commissioner as to whether we get an extension. Remember that one? Yeah. Well, good old Hayne, he just threw that straight back at the Prime Minister and said, well, no, actually it's up to the government. All right, it just playing the ping pong ball back and forth, but he wasn't wearing that one. By now, he's opened his eyes and worked out what was going on, but he's just going to write his report as he would based on what he looked at. So what was he given to look at? Hand up all those who know where the files came from you looked at as, as examples of files. Where did these files come from? Who did the investigation? Anyone know? 
Absolutely submitted by... No, not the regulators, the banks. Because the regulators didn't have any files. Remember all the letters they sent out to my people the last 18 years saying, bugger off, that we don't do investigations. They were right there. They were telling the truth. They don't do investigations. The banks had to quickly... Remember Kelly O'Dwyer saying, oh, we've been working very, very hard. <laughs> She's the minister. She should know. And she was working very hard getting the banks to suddenly... Now, I talk to the banks often. And they were letting me know, oh, Denise, what you've caused is we've had twice as much work than we've ever had. We've got to produce these files. <laughs> Come in, Spinner. All these files came from the bank's old files from three years ago, and everyone was settled. So nobody was angry at the bank because it was settled. That's why Hain had to do this. He had to agree that if somebody came on the stand, they couldn't be then... Uh, held to account because they signed a deed of confidentiality. So why would they go on the witness stand if they signed a deed to settle their complaint and the debt is gone? Why would they do that? So Hayne had to fix that problem and say, well, no, you, you've now been allowed to be able to speak out on this one occasion on this one stand as a witness. So they really, they were witnesses for the bank, were they not? And how many cases did they look at for mortgage fraud that I'm talking about? About three. It took about three days, did it? Three or four. So the entire structure was masterminded by the bank executives. They, all these loans were unaffordable on day one. The mortgage product was sold by the bank officers at 55%, the brokers 45%. They had no idea until they came to me what the fraud was. Their parents got caught in the same way. I know one, I always remember one Chinese guy, suicidal. He got, he had high end worth um, Australian Chinese. I mean, they'd been here for three or four decades, uh, generations. But every one of them had worked hard over the years, built up their wealth, and they didn't, you know, they were frugal. And they had six houses between all the aunts and uncles. And he'd sign them all up on the first day of a 20-year-old being a seller. Mm. I spoke to that man in Sydney, a young man. And the last I heard, he was seriously contemplating suicide. His friends were extremely worried for his safety. I, I don't know the answer to that one. And that was in around 2005. How many deaths this has caused, I don't know. <coughs> but the level of stress on the sellers and the borrowers is, is beyond belief and the bank managers that actually then realised what they'd done, particularly to the farmers. And I, I've spoken to a lot of farmers, yeah, absolutely I have. ASIC called this maladministration in lending. It's not. Maladministration in lending angers me the most. It just means it's an error. The computer made an error. It's not. It's a crime. What part of the word C-R-I-M-E do they not understand? People trapped are made to fool foolish and they've got no help. So this is the evidence we've amassed of brokers not to blame. The BDMs are trained by the banks. The BDMs train then the brokers to meet the quotas. The brokers are not trained in financial advice at all. They're told when you go to sign someone up with the contract three weeks later, don't talk to them, rush in, tell them you've got another appointment, you're a busy man, four minutes, four minute sign-ups, right? They don't want to read the contract because you are not trained to read a contract. And so, therefore, nobody reads the contract. And ASIC say, well, people are stupid enough not to read the contract. But you don't get your copy till six weeks later after the money's paid out. Brokers have no legal skills. They're told to practice on parents first. They trust the banks, like you did, and they're acting as the agents of the bank and told to make people happy. Our lawyers draw up contracts. Have any of you got any relatives that might, just might be, thinking about being sucked into this thing? Because you've got to get the message out there. Yeah, there's a couple up the back there. That there are things that certain auntie, uncle hasn't told you. Things are... 
Sorry? Yes, yes, you need, that's right, if you advise your children to stay away from this. It's not, it's, it's not a new um, way of ripping someone off. It's been done before in the past, but never on this level. Oh, reverse mortgages. We'll do that in another PowerPoint, won't we? <laughs> reverse mortgages. Do not get me started. The, the P&I loans are expensive enough. The um, IO loans are second highest expensive. And the reverse mortgages are just a way to steal money. Give you one quick example. You'll, you'll get about, oh, look, you can, dear, you can go and spend this and you can go on a holiday back to the UK or wherever. You can go and have a nice, in the Bahamas, wherever you want to go, and we'll give you 20,000. Within three years, that's 67,000 you owe us. Thank you. But if you take 60,000, then by about 10 years, you will owe us 398 grand. You've got to pick your date of death with a reverse mortgage. Because you wouldn't want to live more than 10 years or your time's up. Because you'll be out in the gutter. So they're told to make people happy. Our lawyers draw up the contract. Oh, yes, well, don't get me started on the lawyers of the banks that are making zillions. And if they think I've said anything that's partially illegal, go for it, boys. <laughs> and girls. So the cartel and the calculator, we put that up there because this is how they pulled it off with a robot. It's below community expectations, is it not? Yes, but is it something more than that, like criminal attack on the uh, Australian nation? Is it a political attack on our actual economy? I just can't breathe with the idea that we would let this go. If you are thinking that I've done this for 18 years on my own, then you really need to understand that I need more of you he heading in that direction and understanding the true business of what this is all about. So the bank submitted yes. Oh, this was a classic. I wrote this 20-page report to Mr. Hayne. I dot pointed, it was just dot point, because I often do things like that, like you see here, dot point, points a fraud. It lasted 20 pages just for his own idea of the black box. He mentioned the black box, so I knew darn well he'd read it. But that's good. It's got to the right person. It was the right thing to do. He then asked this banker while he was on the stand, I think this was on the second or third her hearing days, uh, hearing sessions, are you acting as one? I love the way Hayne commands the court and, uh, and, uh, or the commission. Are you acting as one? And this banker waffled around and he looked out the window again as he does and then he leans right back with his neck and glares straight at the witness I will ask you one more time. <laughs> and this one on three times, and the third time he said, this is the last time. Are you acting as one? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, was, well, no one wants to be first horse out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great Australian answer, isn't it? But it says it all. In other words, Hain was satisfied. He got what he wanted. It's a big fat yes. They were acting as a cartel. We, uh, I wrote a paper in 2015 for a Senate inquiry that never actually had a hearing. It was an inquiry, but it got shut down because of the election and no one revived it. But I put in a 30-page document to that of penalties for white-collar crime. Bankers, 25 years, no parole, seizure of all assets. Are we all agreed? Yeah. It's in the archives in the parliament. Right, okay. So they used, no wonder they closed that one down. They didn't want to go there then. Used negative gear, gearing, as we said, hypotheticals in the algorithms. The calculators caused every loan to be approved by the computer. The bankers that then engaged in callbacks. So all the poor sellers that got involved in this, 
They were then given the news and it went across feral two years ago in broken news because I wrote, I won, I won an award. I won um, email of the year to broker news because it had the most flooded examples because I said, you're all being ripped off because they're going to claw back the commissions. That's why there's a high turnover rate. Two years later, everything you've worked for as a broker gets clawed back by the bank, so they paid you nothing. Check it out. So the sellers are not to blame. They do not know each other. They can't collude. They are all controlled by the 16 members of the cartel. The bankers are the paymasters and they set the quotas and they haven't changed in the last two weeks. The bank engineers created the calculator. They created all the other instruments we went through. They created the creating wealth industry. Well, that was a doozy. That was to create wealth for themselves. <laughs> bankers engineered the entire process from marketing to spruiking to sourcing to signing up settlements. They paid young people to just go in and go through the credit card list to give you a call at home because your number was there. Control the legal arguments and the contracts and bank BDMs communicate directly with the sellers and they don't know what the fraud is. So should we have had the Royal Commission into the banks? Yes, I believe it was necessary to just open up the can a little bit for a few worms to come out. Not many, but it was necessary. Now do we want Mark II? Absolutely we do. We're not going to go away until the rest of this comes out. And besides, I'm getting a bit weary doing all this. This is not my job, as I keep telling them. The bank's choosing cases to present from the old files, and then there's a one-year dash to the finish line. It's a quickie RC. Only one commissioner... He can only come up with the fact that it was below community expectations, but it's not criminal activity. He didn't see any. For criminal activity, you've got to see a whole bunch of files, don't you? To see the patterns. I'm a criminologist, that's what I do. See patterns in every state in Australia, all through New Zealand when I did talks over there in 2009. Same stuff, same model. Our banks went across the ditch and did the same thing over there. That really is good neighbourly stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Government will not agree to an extension. Looking at the minor issues instead of a much bigger picture, this criminal behaviour in banking is not being examined. And that's why I had these good talks with uh, Craig and Robbie and, and um, Elise and, and uh, Nolene for the last five years, six years, and Glenn. And Gabby? <laughs> they came to my little bush hut. Nobody comes to my bush hut in the, in the middle of WA. I remember that in, in a parliamentary hearing one time. One of the senators asked questions for a three-hour marathon. And at the end of that questioning, um, he said, have you heard of a Denise Braley? This was to Jeff Lucy, who was chairman at the time of ASIC. Oh, he said, oh, Denise Braley... Oh, yes, yeah, she's that lady that lives in WA somewhere. <laughs> he said, yes, that's right, and then closed the thing. That was the end of his questioning. <laughs> so one of the journos that knew me well rang me up and said, a Sydney journal, he said, why did he do that? And I said, oh, that's all right. He's letting Jeffrey know <laughs> that it's all coming from me. He's just had to sweat through seven, three hours of questioning, and they're all my questions, that's why. So the banks gouging fees from dead people, that's what we've heard, have we not? Yes. Banks charging fees from trails that have been clawed back but not refunded to the customer. Well, guess what? These fees add up to a rip-off of about nine grand in ten years. I'm talking about where people have been ripped off 150 grand. 150 to nine, there's no comparison with the crime, is there? So ASIC still blaming the brokers, and we're asking why. Protect the banks, continue the protection racket, government buyer beware policy. I, I, I just can't believe that we're sitting here now and only just learning some of this stuff that is, is coming to fruition now. The class order exemption, that shows that the ASIC 
change the laws to benefit the big banks. And then when they thought I was going to bring it out crashing through the roof, they decided to change it. But there was a lawyer called James Wielden who gave evidence in 2004. And it's worth looking up. That I think that was on the 2nd of April 2014. Uh, I gave my evidence, I think, on the 20th of February 2014 into the Senate. Uh, I've done that a few times. But ASIC, he said, he was a lawyer and he was sitting there at the table with five other lawyers and ASIC commissioner. And he, he was, ASIC commissioner's response was, we've got to do this because the insurance giant chief, I forget his name, has written this letter. And he's written a letter that we have to follow the letter that will go through to approve it. So he wrote his own approval letter. And he also added, if we don't do that, the guy will have my googly, so we've got to sign off on it. <laughs> this James Wilden was such a hero. He's a lawyer in Sydney now on his own private practice. Do you know he'd only been working for ASIC for 12 months? He used to work in New York. Couldn't believe what was happening here. He walked out into the sunlight at lunchtime and never went back. <laughs> he then got paid off by ASIC, as you do. And he waited 10 years to come out with that story uh, with parliamentary privilege, and I think he's a hero. He wasn't going to let that piece of information get buried. And you got the executive with big bonuses, the bank saying, trust me, uh, what for? Trust us to do what? They can uh, collapse the economy. The banks for FOSS and AFCA ignore the lead of the courts. They're saying the broker is the agent of the borrower. It's false. We've had, I led charges with um, research to bring about four or five court cases, seven actually, the spin-offs as well, where the judges have ruled unanimously all the way to the high court as well, the broker is the agent of the bank. The bank pay him, not the customer. It can't be anything else. ASIC still using that false argument. And if you think the newly created, it's only been up three weeks, AVCA, what is it? It's just the same Philip Field, the same ombudsman, in the same office, in the same building, and they put Senator Coonan in charge of that particular thing. So you've got this situation where all they've done is change the brass plate, and that is your consumer complaint agency now. Good luck with that one. The borrowers and brokers do not approve the loans, not one. Borrowers, the, the sellers never approved any loans, nor did the bank managers. You remember they did years ago, but that stopped. It's approved by a computer. It's a grand fraud. So the government's response. So all they're saying is, is it a massive bank fraud? No. There's nothing to see here. We'll just sweep it under the carpet. ASIC will do that job. Does it very well. APRA will just dig its head in the sand as it always does. And yet the thing that got me going the most was no systemic issues. We're lying to Parliament. No systemic issues. What am I doing? So is the economy, as, as, the, as Craig and the others have been saying today, the hazard, the eco economic threat... This is why CEC fights for these issues, why I'm here today. Break up the big banks, creation of a nationally owned bank, bring in Glass-Steggall because Senators Glass and Steggall, did you know, kept global banking at a reasonable level for nearly 50 years. And the minute deregulation comes, and it doesn't matter who deregulated it, it's what they did with the deregulation 10 years later, they the banks. Ran amok with it. The whole world went into deregulation, did it not? Globally. We just kept up with them and went on with that because it sounded fine at the time. We didn't see this coming, did we? Did you all know this through from before today? Some of you did, I know. <laughs> Some of you did. And, and so we... we need the banks to be cleaned up, that's without saying. The nationally owned banking system, we have to go back to at least one of the banks. I, I'm not going to draw straws as to which one that's going to be, but there's probably going to be four pillars left and two will have to amalgamate, whatever. So join CEC that they're asking you to take the fight further with Glass-Steggall. 
that we can learn a lot from Senator Glass and Senator Stegall. That the 1933 regulatory reforms to rein in bad behaviour of the banks, Goldman Sachs, the pump and dump plan, caused the big 1929 short and the depression that followed. Remember the tent cities that sprang up in Central Park? The homeless was beyond belief. Now we've got homelessness now and we think it's just something that dropped out of the sky. How did that happen? The peace in banking for over 50 years was due to regulatory control of the banks. We should never in Australia's history ever again allow bank control frauds to control our lives and the outcomes. The Australian Prudential Regulator, APRA, I can tell you this much. In 1997, John Howard restructured the regulatory system. He desired a free market policy and essential right or wrong. This was the entire banking system and he changed it into a buyer beware zone. He created ASIC as the corporate regulator. He called it his Twin Peaks model. Where did that come from? The UK. A, a, uh, an economist over there, I think that's right, isn't it, came up with the idea of the Twin Peaks model. That means you separate your control of the two regulators and you create two regulators instead of one monolith. Instead, you've got two monoliths of uselessness. But the point was that he created this Twin Peaks. And UK, I remember the quote at the time, said... Well, we'll watch and see what Australia does with that because we're not ready to take the Twin Peaks model just yet. <laughs> so they created it, foisted it on us, and now we've got to get rid of it somehow. It's still there. He took the role of consumer protection away from the consumer competition regulator. Remember that? That was doing, Alan Fells was doing a top job in those days, in the 90s, and gave that responsibility to ASIC. And that's where I mentioned before. Hanratty wrote a paper in 1997 to say that there's a huge conflict of interest in doing this. You've got them to regulate the banks. In other words, ASIC was on conduct of the banks. You even split the, uh, of how they approached it. And APRA to be the prudential regulator of the banks. And now the APRA's trying to explain, well, we do a bit of both. And ASIC is just <coughs> embarrassed to say we haven't done anything. So the banks were just free to do what they want and handing out, obviously, handing out uh, rewards. So the consumer protection was buried for the next two decades. And this is classic neoliberalism. I've got my own political thought on that. And the, I, I have done a political science degree and I, I just feel sorry that uh, most school children are not taught politics as to how it should be in terms of political thought, probably because it'll get invaded and skewed. The model is known as the ill-fated Twin Peaks model of governments and that's what's causing us the problems that we've got now. So the last couple of words I've got on this, what does APRA really do? It's commissioned to guard bank secrecy specifically relating to residential mortgage-backed securities. That is a conversation for another time. But there's an enormous appetite here by the banks for mortgages. And it, that means more people. It's got to bring more people into the Ponzi and it's got to steal all these homes to create more mortgages in interstate sight unseen. That's what they're doing, all right? And the assets of the mum and dad have to feed the beast and those mortgages are repackaged into the bond market and the derivatives and that's for another time. But this is our residential mortgage-backed security scandal that's going to bust wide open. And Americans, if you saw the thing in the big short, there was a scene there. Remember when the fel fellows with colourful language were, were throwing about boxes of files and they said, oh, yeah, this one, where, where did that... Oh, look at this stuff. Oh, what shit is this? So on and so on. And they looked at it, and, they, and, and one, a voice comes out from the other side of the room. Oh, yeah, that's gone to Germany. Oh, yeah, that's gone to Deutschland. Oh, yeah, that's gone to um, uh, wherever it was. And it was all in Germany. So the... Because it was a comedy, the big short, in part, it was a send-up and brilliantly done and brilliantly acted. But the big short was showing you 
that the Americans were gloating, because it was an American film, of course, the Americans are always, you know, they were on the high-ho silver charging out to rescue the people, remember? So the Americans come up with this movie and they wanted to show that Americans had been cleverer than most. They'd sold all the crap mortgages to Germany. <laughs> Poor old Anna Merkel's got them all. But they didn't say who's, who, their superannuation funds in America, whose crap have they bought? Well, yes, it's ours. <laughs> Welcome to the club. So they've got to feed the beast with all these extra mortgages, a huge appetite for mortgages. This is high-risk territory. APRA's role was to monitor the risk factor and report to Treasury once a month. No, no Treasurer can say they didn't know what was going on. APRA failed to know that the plight of the people of the fine side of effects to this financial drug. So our last line, second last line, importance of consumer protection. None of APRA and ASIC activities were in the best interests of Australians, certainly not the next generation. Banks taking on huge risks with other people's money and assets and throwing it onto the bonfire. The cover-up is gobsmacking. It's never good for our economy. And ignoring these ro those risks and ignoring the absolute importance of consumer protection, the borders on criminal ne negligence, nothing is being done. There's no jailing. We've got to get, uh, grow the strength that Icelanders had and do the same thing here in Australia, down under. And we can do this. We have the evidence. APRA 2007 report on the risks in the RMBS sector has been hidden. They won't release it. We'll force the release of that document. Low dock lending was suppressed and our members are demanding the truth from BFCSA. If you know somebody, they can join BFCSA online. Just go to the website, join up. Costs you a dollar a week per person for a year. So what percentage of the born mortgage loan books? This is the big question for Parliament right now. The big four major banks are on non-prime loans, because they call them non-prime. It's a little more respectable, isn't it? <laughs> And what percentage of the mortgage-backed securities are non-prime loans? Well, we'll give you a figure. Based on our research, it's about 80%, not the 40% APRA said. How do I know it? Because the sellers tell me, oh, no, Denise, we're told to sell. We sell mostly 80 or 90% are Lodox. We still do. And now they've changed the name in 2016, the government they don't, and the banks. They don't call them Lodox anymore, do they? Oh, no, Lodox... Sounds like a dirty word that the Americans had a problem with. We'll call them IOs. So that's why I asked on the first slide, hands up all those who know what an IO loan is. You see where it's all coming from? Very clever. So what comes next? Lobby the, the end of my talk. The <laughs> lobbying for a proper Royal Commission Mark II. Must have two or three year Royal Commission probe, full powers. Wide terms of reference must be overseen by three royal commissioners, must properly investigate, interrogate ASIC, APRA and the RBA and show compassion. Most important, don't demonise these people. Have a go at the banks that caused it because you won't solve the problem by blaming the person in the playground that's been bullied, will you? You asked for it. Are we over the 1950s now? You asked for it? No, they didn't ask for this. Support the groups are bringing this message to you all, including the CEC. I'm, I'm happy to come down, Craig, and give you whatever hand you like. Uh, as I do all this on a pension, as you know, so um, uh, thank you for flying me down here. <laughs> all right, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs>